Okay, let's talk about the Enlightenment. Enlightenment and coffee, 18th century, that is the 1700s. The Enlightenment is the age of reason. That should stand out because it has nothing to do with emotion. So these guys aren't major graphic artists and illustrators. They're more about writing about logical sequences of thought that criticize the status quo. So we're criticizing religion, we're criticizing aristocracy or governments of different sorts. It's the age of reason, it's scientific inquiry increases in a major way. Scientific discoveries abound, uh, you know, Newton, Linnaeus, and, and uh, so many others um, that bring uh, scientific invention in this new Atlantic economy. And so make no mistake that this Atlantic economy fuels the Enlightenment. Without it, we wouldn't have had extra wealth. We wouldn't have had so many books floating around. Why? Because we have people with extra wealth and recreational time to read those books. They're literate, you know. They have somewhat of an education. They're not all laborers and poor. We actually have economic stimulation, the great amount of publishing of books that have to do with the Enlightenment. And a good illustration for that is coffee. In the 18th century, coffee houses became huge. So in the 1700s, we had basically Starbucks everywhere. Even small towns in England had a coffee house in the 18th century. I think that's very interesting because we don't think of the English as a coffee drinking folk. What do the English usually drink? Tea, yeah, right. And there's a reason for that and it has to do with the Atlantic trade economy. Coffee is of course a miracle drug. It keeps you awake, it makes you happy. It allows you to concentrate when somebody's standing in front of you and blabbing for a whole hour. Uh, coffee is a miracle drug. For people who don't have coffee and don't have a major stimulant like coffee, it is amazing. Coffee is a product that when it first comes out, it's easier to see how dramatic of a product it is. These days we have coffee everywhere, you know, so we don't think of how intimate it is with our own lives. But many speculate, and, and many historians are not for sure but there is reason to believe that coffee has something to do with intellectual pursuits. Reading literally makes you tired <laughs> until you get over that hurdle. I mean, you have to read like an athlete. You have to build your, your muscles to resist fatigue, just like any athlete when you read and listen. But coffee prevents that. Coffee allows you to take in more information more rapidly. We don't talk about that now because we have stimulants everywhere. We drink soda, we drink whatever. Stimulants are around everywhere, so we don't think about it. So. Coffee houses were everywhere in England. This is a fo uh, picture photo. <laughs> this is a drawing of a coffee house. Let's look at that a little bit. The matron of the house, that's a common feature. Many public houses and even later, a, a woman who kind of lives there and takes care of everything, signs people up, sells things if needed. That's, a, that's quite a common sight to see a sort of older matron woman. Uh, what we'd say is behind the counter. <laughs> Now coffee, its active ingredients are activated uh, with heat. We have the coffee warming up in front of the fireplace here, uh, violently steaming out. So it'd be very, very hot coffee. Notice the room is lit by candles artificially. The artist most likely gave this scene a lot more light than what you would see. You would see a great amount of light here and flickering shadows everywhere depending on what time of day it is. But we see in this commercial economy really, you know, probably somewhat well-to-do peoples coming out. Um, you have to have sort of recreational time. You can't have a nine to five job to really pursue uh, academic pursuits. Newspapers were huge at this time. Coffee houses and newspapers went together. You wouldn't always go buy a newspaper. You would go to the coffee house to read the newspaper. Um, so that's what they're all doing there. And they talk, they discuss the news. It's really kind of a novel thing. It's almost trendy. These days we have newspapers, we have coffee, so we don't celebrate it as itself. We don't get together and drink coffee and say, oh, this is wonderful coffee and read the newspaper and talk about how great it is to have newspapers and really be interested in this gossip and the politics of it. You know, we have the internet. We're much more scattered. Now let's look at the coffee. Let's look at the products. One of the things a historian might do is uh, looking at, this is a primary source, of course, because it was illustrated before our own period, uh, more contemporary with this period. And so we can look at it and, and extract things maybe we didn't realize at first. So I want you to look fairly closely at this, but try to extract some things that you see from this. Notice that uh, the servant, a little kid or something? I'm not sure. 
Of course, um, I like how they're using the candles to show that they have to use the candles really to see what's on the wall. Pretty neat. What other product do you see aside from coffee that is a result of the Atlantic trade? Ooh, that's a good one. I don't see any sugar, but they're probably, yeah, tobacco, right, right. This guy right here. Yeah, what is that? It might be, it's probably tobacco. Tobacco was, uh, of course, really big. So it was coffee, cotton, the potato. And so, you know, what I was saying earlier is coffee is really hot, so we can extract some material ideas from this. So notice the servant here, he's serving coffee. One thing, uh, when we think about a really hot coffee, scalding hot coffee, look how he's pouring that really far away from the cup. What's that do? It cools it off. Yeah, yeah, and it's fancy. And that's a shallow cup, too. I mean, you have to, you have to approach the cup low and then go high, because you're not gonna like, you know, right from there, right? And now notice the cups. What's up with that? Yeah, they're really shallow like bowls. That tells you that maybe they didn't try to drink a whole lot. The effects of coffee are quite dramatic, right? Really, unless you drink it all the time. <laughs> but I remember, you know, working in produce at Walmart a long time ago, having to wake up at five, but drinking coffee right at five, and it like, that, that ability for it to wake you up is just unlike anything else. And so it's shallow, because that also keeps it cool, doesn't it? If it's shallow and there's not much in it. So there are several things that have to go on with a cooling a product. What about this, uh, the tobacco pipe? Apparently they're obsessed with cooling things that are hot, because you see this sort of stem in pipes that are made to cool the smoke as it enters your throat. Because if you have a smaller tobacco pipe, your throat will be affected. Your throat will get heated up, you'll get you know, kind of a raspy voice, and over time, it will affect your throat. But this keeps the heat off your vocal cords. Interesting stuff. I don't know what this is. It's kind of a longer flute. What's that? Oh, down here? Yeah, I don't know. It looks like one of them at least is like the coffee cups. It might be the sugar that someone mentioned. Oh, you know what? Those are, I think those are pipes. Because look at the white coming off of them. And it looks like that one. Why would they have a box of pipes? Like, bring your own pipe, dude. Like, I want the house pipe. Oh, you, oh there are some more pipes. Yo, yeah, oh, they're everywhere. Well, maybe they are house pipes. Like, uh, you know, spend a penny and you'll get a, some coffee and a pipe to smoke on with a pinch of tobacco. I don't know. The Enlightenment, it began as a reaction to Louis XIV. And the, the people that really began the Enlightenment are people that were upset with Louis XIV. And they're actually Huguenots. They were Protestants who began the Enlightenment. Uh, just a little bit later, one of your head figures of the Enlightenment, Voltaire, was certainly not Protestant. He was deist, even. But why would Louis XIV set off the Enlightenment? I'll give you a hint. They didn't like him. <laughs> it wasn't something good that he did that inspired the Enlightenment, necessarily, directly. Why would Protestants in France, you know, why would they be upset with Louis XIV and want to try to reason and talk about natural rights and constitutionalism and coffee? So Louis XIV, in terms of religion, the thing we've talked about is he revoked the Edict of Nantes. No more Protestants, no more Calvinists, no more Huguenots in France. So you get this, this great movement of Huguenots out of France. And so that sets off the Enlightenment. And so a lot of these figures in the Enlightenment moved to what it could be called the Trinity of the Enlightenment, P-A-L. Three major cities in Europe, probably the most well-known, formed the Triangle of the Enlightenment. They were major cities which housed your authors and your public figures who wrote about the Enlightenment and inspired people to do new things, inspired governmental reform, separation of church and state, the promotion of science. What are these European cities? Paris, Amsterdam, London. Amsterdam is often known as the most tolerant. So Amsterdam has accepted many peoples uh, who had another, no other place to go in Europe, whether they were Catholic or Protestant or Jews or whatever. And so remember, the Enlightenment began as a reaction to Louis XIV, began with Protestants who really wanted to protest Louis XIV. But because our people more, are, are more literate and the whole idea of publishing a book is more, you know, it's accepted, there are actual markets for books. In other words, I can publish a book People might even read it, you know, opposed to publishing a book and only a small percentage of people that can read. The Enlightenment is at that time where people have money to buy and they have time to read and they have literacy to be able to read. So it's sort of that movement and that reaction from these basically authors and journalists who criticized Louis XIV kind of tipped it off. 
they started using reason and logic and natural law and philosophy. And it stimulated readers and other people to do the same, but not necessarily as a reaction to Louis XIV, but as a reaction to, say, government and religion. So be able to understand the beginnings of the Enlightenment and the trinity of cities. And books, books everywhere, people reading books. That has a lot to do with the Enlightenment. I call the Enlightenment the attack of the books. Enlightenment, just keep in mind that this is the crux of the struggle between constitutionalism and absolutism. So governments, people are looking at their governments more objectively now than ever, trying to use reason to say, well, really, what is the best form of government? What should I think about kings and nobility or the church and priests? It's an age of scientific discovery. The church becomes pretty nervous. Scientists began talking about things that it was only the church that used to explain. And so the church becomes very uneasy. But also scientific discovery is something that people are very interested in in terms of reading about it in newspapers and reading books. It's almost like uh, during the Kennedy administration when we went to the moon. Everyone was interested in NASA and going to the moon and competing with the Russians and, and everything that that involved. People would buy books on planets and stars and space in mass. So it, it was a popular, it wasn't just the, the elite intellects, it was also the popular mind that had to do with scientific discovery. Atheism and deism. What is an atheist? Can someone tell me? Don't believe in God, yep. That's pretty much what that word says. No God. Deism is what? A little more difficult. This is a word for God. So you're like, Godism. Uh, deism is... Your textbook tells you that as a result of the Enlightenment, for a lot of people, there were only two choices when it came to religion. And your book says atheism and deism. It doesn't say Protestantism and Catholicism, you know, or Hinduism. It says something, two things very, very unique. Atheism is the idea that, like, you began reading books about the Enlightenment, you read Rousseau and Voltaire and Newton and you see a world where God does not need to be present at all. And so you might become an atheist. And you read their criticisms of the church and you say, well, the church is obviously man-made and God does not exist. Deism says, yes, religion is man-made. Religion is of man and not of God, but there most likely is a creator. Because you look at the world and you look at the order of things, you look at nature, and some people automatically say, well, there has to be a creator. There has to be some, someone holding it together and organizing things. Voltaire thought that. And those are the deists. But what makes them different than Christians is that they are pretty much anti-religion. So, in other words, a deist would probably take offense if a Christian said, oh, we're, we're just the same. The deist might say something like, no, you're a Christian. You must, must use Jesus Christ as an e intermediary between you and God. That's, that, that's, not, that's the opposite of what deism stands for. Deism says God is distant, God does not really care about what's going on, and plus, if there is an all-ruling, all-knowing God, why would it require us to believe in it or do stuff for it? You know, sort of thing. So deus, so that's logical type thinking. That's cold, hard logic, right? So when you really reason things out, you either get to atheism or you get to deism. Deism is clever because it cancels out religion but keeps God in the equation. Kind of neat. So when we talk about most of our founding fathers, as we like to say, in this era, they were deists. So, and then slavery. I just want to mention something about slavery in the Enlightenment. Now keep in mind, slavery is, is crucial for the economy. There is huge money wrapped in slavery. It's a business unto itself, even. Um, but when it comes to enlightened thinkers, enlightened thinkers have different takes on things. Like Voltaire, for example, would criticize the privileges of the aristocracy and priests, but at the same time, he thought democracy was the stupidest idea in the world. He wrote Catherine the Great and um, praised the benevolent monarchy, but said democracy was just Stupidest idea you've ever heard in your life. But there were enlightened authors who debated slavery. Now keep in mind, something you will want to know about slavery at this time, is slavery was not acceptable to Christian Europeans. No slavery. Outlawed. You can't have slaves. For a long time. The idea of slavery was unheard of. The Pope had already declared that you could never make a, a uh, slave out of a Christian. No Christians can be slaves. No Christian should ever enslave another Christian. 
So then how did we start justifying inhumane treatment of slaves? Some of the authors of the Enlightenment and other thinkers said, slaves are not Christians, they can't be Christians, they're a certain type of race, right? So notice slaves at this time, Central and Western African. They're a specific type. They look different than Europeans, right? So you can say that this person, because they look different, and they're obviously not Christians because they probably can't even speak the language yet, and you actually see this through ancient cultures. Humans, I don't think, naturally believe that slavery is okay, but you have to dehumanize whatever that slave class is to make it acceptable for the human mind. And that's how we did it. Slavery, perfectly acceptable to some people. Why? Because we say that the slave is inferior, naturally inferior, and say naturally a slave. So people would actually convince themselves of that. So when we say, how in the world at this time could we have slavery, when morally it was, an apprehens it was, a, it was a horrible thought. Some people and historians will tell you that slavery was a normal, accepted thing. It wasn't. It was because it made so much money, and pe people began wrapping their heads around the idea that, that a Central and West African is somehow inferior. You actually see efforts of people, especially in the South, uh, early on, um, keeping African slaves from learning to read and worshiping. So, you know, a lot of your Southerners in the United States initially had big problems with Christianizing the slave population. Um, it, it makes your slave class way too human. It makes them like you. You're like, oh, you're a Christian brother. Ooh, this whole slavery thing becomes problematic, you know. So enlightened thinkers could go either way. You, they could rationalize uh, slavery or they could speak against it. Enlightened thinkers weren't always talking about the same thing. They were trying to use reason to do it, and that's the common theme. Uh, Voltaire, the age of the Enlightenment is often called the age of Voltaire. In post-Louis XIV France, we already have the Enlightenment being inspired by his, his uh, totalitarian religious control and so Voltaire came out of France, grew up in France. He actually is a minor, was a minor noble. His father wanted him to be a lawyer, but Voltaire uh, pretended that he was training as a lawyer and actually just wrote poetry full time. <laughs> and so he would publish plays and poetry. And he was really more of a comedian. Keep in mind at this time when I say poetry or plays, it's not necessarily what you're thinking of as today. You know, some poem, maybe kind of boring or whatever, and a play, you know. Uh, maybe it's not that appealing, but people thought poems and plays were very trendy. But the way Voltaire wrote is he, he wrote comedy, uh, pretty hilarious stuff if you know his references. He was, a com he was a satirist, he was a comedian, but he was prolific and well-learned. He would write about history and that sort of thing. So he became wildly popular uh, eventually. And as he, as he was popular, he once wrote a, a poem and insulted the region of France, uh, Philippe II, and he inferred that uh, the regent had an incestuous affair with his own niece. And so they locked him up for 11 months in the Bastille. And his last name was Arouet. And he changed his name to Voltaire after he was lit out of prison, after he was there for 11 months. And he became Voltaire, uh, he would say at that point. And so he became sort of a force of political reform. So he would write his books that were wildly popular and influence political change, like in France. He emphasized separation of church and state. One of his main complaints was basically how priests are um, set up in France to not have to pay taxes. Priests exploiting the poor, you know, taking advantage of people, holding great power, and uh, not being what they should be, Christian priests, you know. So he, he criticized religion quite a bit. Uh, enlightened despots love him, Frederick the Great, Catherine the Great. Um, they, uh, they wanted him at their court, you know. Um, when you really begin to read Voltaire, it's confusing because he'll say certain things you don't expect. Even though he's considered the father of modern liberalism, he'll say some things that are like, whoa, <laughs> not even a conservative would say that these days, you know, like being pro-monarchy is one example. Voltaire also helped popularize scientific discovery. So he popularized Newton. So we know Newton today is coming up with so many great uh, scientific laws of nature. And what's interesting about Newton is he didn't necessarily do lab tests to come up with his greatest discoveries. He just sat and thought about it. He just thought about it. He saw an apple fall from a tree, right? And then he realized that things aren't pushed, things are pulled. And he discovered gravity. 
essentially. He discovered that by sitting there and thinking and looking at things, not by running equations. And this was respected in the age of reason. People could, you know, like even Descartes, you can use logic. People are excited about the idea that you can use your brain and come to conclusions if you can think outside of what your religion and your parents have taught you, have, have programmed into you. You can start using re a reason to break out of the mold. And so you can see where that's really exciting. People and authors left and right are trying to shatter the illusions of the people. So that has a lot to do with government and arist aristocracy and religion. So all over the place, people are bursting out of their shells, intellectual shells.